Victorian era. The Victorian era uh, was during the reign of Queen Victoria, which it was named after. Uh, she was the longest reigning female monarch. She actually reigned for 64 years, which is longer than uh, the previous female monarch, which was uh, Queen Elizabeth. Um, the early Victorian period was really a neoclassical movement, similar to what was happening in France, and then incorporated a neo-Gothic look as well. In the mid-Victorian, uh, it's a French Baroque revival, so um, very heavily decorated. And then in the late Victorian per period, we see again uh, a neo-Renaissance and empire style begin to develop. So sadly, for us women, um, we really were, were defined by society, society, but not only them, by actual law in regards to 
our um, role. So status was achieved for women through possessions and lifestyle. Of course, you would need to be married to a rich man and um, own the finest of clothing and furniture and multiple houses. Uh, servants ran the kitchen, there is that, uh, and provided for the domestic services. But those servants were often women. And any um, status within the servant realm was usually held by a man. So the role of women strictly defined by law and society. Um, and you can check out that website for Mind Your Manners uh, to be truly horrified. So even though there was a female monarch, uh, it was still believed that a woman's place was in the home and their career was literally marriage. They couldn't own property, they could not divorce, they could not vote, and they couldn't sue anyone, uh, especially their husband. They were meant to be dutiful and not to have any opinion, which is why the Jane Austen books are so popular because women during this era uh, in her books were um, definitely opinionated. And because of this uh, really staunch society, reform does begin, begin to happen towards the latter part of this era. With the Industrial Revolution, brings uh, wonderful new, new materials and new technology. Um, so we get to build with steel. We now have plate glass uh, in mass production, laminated and bent wood, um, linoleum, chemical dyes, which is great for um, tapestries and fabric, uh, and springs for upholstered furniture so they can make it considerably more luxurious and comfortable. We have gas lighting, electricity, subways. The biggest outcome of the Industrial Revolution, of course, is the, are, were the railroads. And so subway systems made it possible for people to live in suburbs as opposed to a very expensive downtown core. And if you're thinking of London, um, certainly that's probably one of the most expensive cities to live in in the world. So it made it possible for everybody to move out of that core. Uh, elevators were significantly more convenient. Um, washrooms, uh, mechanical systems, bicycles, and then of course photography. With mass production of course comes mass marketing and those printing presses were very very handy for that. Um, but it also created the desire for novelty and new inventions and we currently live in a society like that right now we don't really take care of what we have because we can just buy something new. If our shoes fall apart, it's very exciting for us to go out and buy a new pair of shoes. Um, so there were a lot of romantic ideals and ambitions and um, it was really an era, era of uh, gathering artistic and nostalgic furnishings and accessories from any era of the past and then combining them in a very eclectic manner. And we always associate this this period as a rom to romance because the rose became a very very popular um, flower and also symbol and decorative option uh, during the Victorian era as well. The Great Exhibition had a significant impact as it attracted 13,000 uh, exhibitors from all over the world. Um, all kinds of exhibits of art and furniture, and then a showcase for industry introducing new manufacturing methods and materials. And these things still go on. These are still um, a societal um, valued happenings in right now in this, in this time and era. Um, certainly for interior design, the, the Neocon uh, convention in Chicago is, is the biggest and very well, in my personal opinion, the best as well. So the Great Exhibition uh, was held in Hyde Park in London from May 1st to October 15th, so a significant period of time. And um, it was held in this beautiful building called the Crystal, Crystal Palace by Joseph Paxton. And you may remember from History of Architecture that uh, this was a, a building that was put up in six months, and it was a, a mass production in itself. So repeated modules that were easily um, stacked together, built in a factory, shipped to site, and then an assembly line essentially put this building together 
and uh, it was assembled quite quickly. And it was a great demonstration of the possibilities of new materials, specifically uh, steel and plate glass, and it showed advances in structural engineering. It was definitely a very heavily decorated area era, so it was overdressed, it was overstuffed, it was cluttered, cluttered, crowded, dark, but it was comfortable. So the scale of furniture was often not appropriate for the space. Um, every surface was decorated. It's sounding a lot like the Baroque era. Um, what you view here is a a tete a tete, and it was a special type of seating that was. Uh, organized so that women and men could sit on the same piece of furniture but not touch each other because remember um, society had very very specific rules for women and one of them was not touching a man that they were not married to. Because of the Industrial Revolution wallpaper was very uh, easy to produce um, so a popular wallpaper was called fresco, which of course uh, imitates panels, cornices, friezes, moldings, uh, and columns from a Greek or Roman era. And um, they would coordinate wallpapers with colors of paint uh, that would be used for ceilings or woodwork. Borders were essential um, because it covered the minor mistakes made in trimming wallpapers during the installation. And you can see that the colors are um, a lot of jewel colors that the green and of course the the red as well were very popular colors during this era. The introduction of um, synthetic pigment during this era made it available uh, for a multitude of premixed paints. And so the use of color was very, very predominant during the Victorian era. Now, they believed that a healthy home contained a balance of uh, complementary hues. And the reason that healthy is in quotations there is that, sadly, this paint was lead-based. So it has been ter determined, obviously, um, in more recent years that lead is pretty much death to humans. So healthy is a, a subjective term there. Uh, darker colors were gener generally used in town and city homes to obscure p pollution. Pollution would be from uh, cars running on diesel and uh, trains that ran on coal, and their emissions were um, black smoke and and um, and death, essentially. So color choice was often determined by what was available in the pigments. Window coverings were very popular during the Victorian design uh, era, and shockingly, it looked very, very similar to women's clothing. Um, heavy draperies that were highly layered, often with uh, fringe on it as well. Um, and of course, your status was directly related to how well you were dressed also. And it's not like these women would have a closet full of dresses. They would maybe have three or four that um, they would keep in heavy rotation um, because of course the amount of fabric that you see in their dresses in the image it was a very expensive endeavor um, cotton was very common during this period it, it was easy to get your hands on cotton at this time uh, silk was very expensive um, and the woolen industry was very very slow to revolutionize and and that's still very true of today if anybody has ever visited scotland um, so to give an air of wealth, uh, you would often see a silk brocade, uh, both in draperies as well as fashion. Uh, silk brocade, damask, satin, taffeta, and of course velvet. It was actually the um, Gothic revival that saw the increased use of stained glass during the Victorian period. And uh, what we see here is uh, a jeweled and stained glass in a Moorish motif, um, but still using that uh, Palladian style window at the top, so that arched window. 
in residential architecture during the Victorian era, um, the Victorian era is known as the Battle of the Styles due to all of the revivals during this period. Um, so the top image, the, the Gothic revival home. Um, during the Victorian era, there was a, a, another great surge of re religious movement. So they returned to the church and looked to the Gothic period for dominant Christian values. So a lot of the things that we see from the Gothic period um, are applied to the homes. For example, the pointed arch forms, um, those steeply pitched roofs, um, pointed arches that we see, uh, aspires, very, very tall chimneys. Um, it's also referred to as carpenter gothic uh, due to the ornamentation that is achieved with wood as opposed to stone in the true gothic period. So when we look at the, the, the fascia of the building, it is heavily sculpted and looks very, very similar to the interiors of, of gothic spaces. The bottom image is a really, really great um, image of Italianate style, which is borrowing essentially from the Romans. Um, we see uh, low sloping hipped roofs, heavy cornices, uh, columns, an arcade, a portico, um, and of course that, that heavy decoration uh, over top of the windows as well, and a lot of use of arches. The second empire home that we see here uh, was actually a style that was borrowed from France, and it was named for after the reign of Napoleon uh, III, which we, we saw in um, previous styles. What we see on this particular home is a mansard roof. Um, so it has a steep, visible front face, and it allowed the story below uh, to be living space, which was very, very desirable at the time. Um, and then we see dormers in the mansard roof as well. Um, it's very similar to Italianate, uh, a lot of bay windows um, and uh, a lot of eaves with brackets, uh, some cornice molding, but again, of course, the empire style was borrowing from a Renaissance style. Um, so we see arches the, or the Palladian style windows um, as well as the use of columns. The Queen Anne style is <laughs> a little bit more uh, eclectic, a very asymmetrical facade on that particular home, uh, irregular and very complex roofs, um, a lot of towers that are round, uh, but they could also be square or um, polygonal as well at the front corner, uh, a second story porch, which is always desirable. But uh, typical to Queen, Queen Anne revival home styles is there's there's a lot of um, mixture of materials and textures uh, for surface decoration. So each story may be treated differently. Um, we see a lot of spindle work and uh, changes in wall plane as well. The stick style home um, or the high Victorian or East Lake style really evolved out of the, the carpenter Gothic that we saw previously. So um, it's actually taking uh, that vertical emphasis and applying it to uh, the home. Um, of course, name stick style because of the decorative stick work that's on the front. That stick work it doesn't have any structural component to it, even though it's mimicking the balloon framework um, like a skeleton, essentially, on the home. Uh, pointed dormers and very often square towers, and also often asymmetrical as well. Now the exotic or octagon style um, was really derived out of Napoleon's campaign in Egypt. Um, and the exotic style was originally applied to cemeteries, lodges, and public monuments. But um, it evolved into a residential style that combined uh, Moorish, Asian, and Turkish styles all together. And then, of, co of course, the octagon style uh, encompasses a single story porch with a light vent, and of course, the floor plan is in the shape of an octagon. Um, and of, of course, all of these houses, being as expensive as they are, would have indoor plumbing in them. The Romanesque style was pretty obvious. It 
basically looks like a mini church of this home. Um, so we see that really heavy brick masonry or stone masonry, uh, the round arch windows, the um, turrets, that vertical emphasis, the um, arched entryway, uh, spire-like um, flue options for their for their um, fireplace on the top. And architect Henry Hobson Richardson at the time was really the one to promote this particular style. Now the shingle style is actually something that we see a lot in Edmonton. It's very, very common. Um, and it borrows from the Queen Anne style with that um, different textures and different options for the facade decoration. Uh, so it uses shingles as an exterior wall finish. Uh, very wide porches um, and a very large uh, footprint generally for the most part. But as far as decoration goes, uh, it is significantly subdued compared to the Queen Anne style. The most common Victorian home was the Folk Victorian for very good reason, uh, because it was a kit that you could purchase. And because um, railroads expanded into smaller towns and cities, you could ship these kits all over the country. Um, so mass-produced wood features could be transported uh, very quick and very inexpensively. And then home builders only had to add um, trim and ornament uh, as, well, as well as provide a, a foundation for the home as well. Um, so it's not as elaborate as some of the styles that we've seen previously, but uh, they generally kept it very symmetrical, obviously, uh, keeping um, the same length of, of lumber is much easier and it's much easier to produce uh, a kit when it is all symmetrical as well. Masculine and feminine rooms were very important during the Victoria era, again due to the separation of um, uh, women's duties and men's duties as defined by society and law. Um, so being able to have these types of rooms really reflected the prosperity and status um, as well as the aesthetic and cultural interests of um, the occupants of the house. So um, usually the drawing room or the parlor was the most spacious and had the highest ceilings. And it would often have the best furniture, which meant that children were forbidden in these rooms. And the drawing room or parlor would be used for afternoon tea and maybe for hosting balls um, at home. It was considered feminine. It was always lavishly decorated and used primarily for receiving visitors. Um, the design intent is to be ostentatious enough to be impressive and comfortable enough to be hospitable. So again, a lot of comfortable furniture, a lot of furniture to uh, have a space for everybody to sit in as well. The smoking room was obviously more masculine and it was used essentially to uh, get away from the ladies. So they would smoke cigars and drink in, in their um, smoking rooms. And when we're looking at the interiors, it's not as uh, highly decorated and it's a little bit more uh, bulky in the furniture, not as much carving um, or ornamentation. So they're, they're simplifying it a little bit for masculine tastes. Bedrooms were also kept separate as well, uh, generally in wealthy households. So the husband and wife slept separately um, and the bedrooms would be adjoined by a door. Uh, also with those bedrooms, each room would get a dressing room uh, and then the wife would have an additional sitting room if they were wealthy. But in smaller homes, there was generally one bedroom, but there would be a separate dressing room for the husband. Again, um, different rules for the men versus the women. Finally, during the Victorian era, a new kind of room was born, and that was the bathroom, uh, with the addition of running water and indoor plumbing, and the invention of a uh, flushable water closet, uh, which made life considerably more comfortable. 
So Victorian style on its own is not really a true style, uh, but a mix of all previous uh, styles. For example, the Renaissance, uh, Italian as well as French, uh, French Baroque, neoclassical styles. So we see a lot of exaggerated curves, uh, very heavy carvings, and a lot of marble tops as well. The French Baroque and Rococo uh, revival see that fleur de lis on the top of this particular panel. Um, this is more of a Rococo style because, of course, it's it's got some negative space to it um, and some very elegant uh, paintings that are carved in light pastels. The Victorian furniture were, was always ornate. Um, a lot of whatnot shelves uh, to display little knickknacks, things like hummels. Uh, the born uh, seating furniture, again, was to allow for multiple people to be sat, but to not have to touch. And the same for the, the barus as well. Now the Ottoman, uh, we're used to those. They usually are a footrest, but it was used more as a, a seating unit. And a lot of times it would have a cone uh, shaped backrest in the middle as well. And uh, the sleigh bed, which is an adaptation of the French Empire day beds that were um, made popular during that era. John Henry Belter uh, was an American German cabinet maker and he perfected the process of laminating wood. Uh, so it wouldn't need to be expensive pieces of solid wood um, to create a piece like this. You could laminate it with less expensive um, veneer woods in the center and then finish it off, of course, with expensive pieces on the outside. Um, so the resulting cross grained uh, glued plywood was steam molded into Rococo style pieces, um, much like the vis-a-vis -vis that we see in this particular image. And of course, um, the, the plywood that they used would be used for uh, structural components as well underneath all of the um, silk upholstery that we see here. Um, so the vis-a-vis, -vis, similar to the tete-a-tete -tete and um, previous seating options, it really kept people from touching inappropriately, but they were able to look at each other uh, while they had a conversation, as opposed to some of those other seating options that we saw where you would literally um, have your back to the person sitting beside you. There were a lot of designs that really were not that successful in uh, real life. Um, it was really popular for furniture designers during, during this time to patented, patent their designs and then claim the production rights of it. Um, but it produced some really unfortunate things. Um, and, and I blame the Industrial Revolution for the ability of this as well, for coming up with new technologies. But um, chairs made out of paper mache that would be gilded, um, which are not very structurally sound. Um, large rounder settees that we saw that would prevent people from touching them but was not really conducive to conversation. Um, everything was generally very overstuffed and um, and really took up a significant amount of room in the space as well. One of the most successful, however, out of furniture designs and the most produced and copied and replicated uh, would be the Vienna Cafe or the Bistro Chair, as it's referred to. So 40 million chairs were sold between 1859 and 1839. Uh, it happens to be still in production. I was at Neocon in Chicago uh, last week, and uh, this company is still thriving and still building um, the style of furniture. It was uh, designed by Michael um, Thone, and it's actually a Rococo revival. Um, he called it the Vienna Cafe Chair as the Chancellor of Austria convinced him to move to Vienna where he actually opened up his own company and patented a steam bending process for wood. Um, so the great thing about this chair is that there's very, very few components. It's easily mass produced. Um, so screws were used to hold it together. 
uh, even though it was very unfashionable to show joinery during this period. So that is why uh, they were able to sell 40 million shares during that period because he made it very simple uh, by keeping it to a small number of pieces and pieces that were easy to um, manufacture. Now Thonay discovered that a solid piece of wood uh, being beech could be steamed and then um, bent and a metal strap could be bent um, together with it in a certain way without cracking the wood. Um, and then after it dries out on a jig, the wood would hold its shape. So a strong chair, a very strong chair, could be made with less pieces and less joints and uh, screws replacing glued connections. Uh, and then the manufacturing process was protected in 1856 under a 10-year non-renewable patent. So sadly, that's why there's so many replications now is because of course that patent ran out. Why is it so influ influential? It was the first mass-produced inexpensive chair, um, which is truly a modern design despite being a Rococo uh, revival. It only has six components um, and it would be shipped, knocked down, so very, very inexpensively and then the owner would assemble it on site. <laughs> Does that sound familiar? It should sound a lot like IKEA. Um, the idea of a solid, layered, and veneered wood uh, made malleable through mechanical or chemical methods led to imaginative and experimental ideas from modern furniture designers, which we'll see in later periods as well. Let's not forget that Thonet actually lived during the Victorian era, so um, his rockers looked very Victorian in style. Because of that upholstered and tufted seat and uh, later variations uh, happened to make it a little bit lighter with a caned seat instead, which is the top image. The profits of the Great Exhibition of 1851 were used to purchase the land uh, for the Victoria and Albert Museum, which is Britain's premier decorative arts museum, and it is glorious. So again, we see that neoclassical uh, design on the exterior, which is um, true of the Victorian era, um, but it kind of goes against all of the technology uh, and innovation that was happening during the Industrial Revolution.